the 132nd Psalm. You'll recall that this series of psalm, psalms, 15 of them, are called Songs of Degrees or Songs of Ascents. And they were the, um, the songs that were sung as the uh, worshipers went up to Jerusalem. You remember that the uh, religious laws required that they go up to Jerusalem and to worship three times out of the year. And so uh, these were the songs they would sing on their way to Jerusalem. So most of them are centered uh, in, uh, in Zion. Uh, the, the temple area was on Mount Zion. And these latter ones, uh, the uh, pilgrims or the worshipers are already there at the city. They've arrived. At the, we, we saw them way off contemplating coming up to where the city where it was, and we saw them when they first got their gl glimpse of the city and so forth. These 15 psalms are a progression, and we're in the last three now, and we're, we're at the city, and we're at the temple at this point. And you notice this 132nd one is uh, a little unique in that it's more than twice as long as any of the other of the 15. Uh, the, the, those psalms beginning with 120 and extending through 134. So you'll see this one is considerably longer. Now this psalm divides itself between the 10th and the 11th verses. The first ten verses you'll recognize to be a prayer or a petition to God, and then the uh, verses 11 through 18 is God's response to that prayer. And the uh, first, the first ten verses then, which are the petition, again divides itself into two parts: uh, five verses and five verses. We'll read the first five verses, and you can uh, see uh, how the division comes. Psalm 132, verse 1. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. And this is what uh, he swore or vowed. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed, I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Now, this is in reference to the time that David had it in his heart to build the temple. Uh, he, uh, you remember he called the, the uh, prophet Nathan to him. He says, uh, look, Nathan, I've built this beautiful home for myself to live in. And he says, the Ark of the Covenant, which is, represents the very presence of God, is in a tent that's rather weather-beaten, and I want to build the most ornate building that there's ever been. And Nathan says, well, go ahead. But uh, God didn't permit David to go ahead. He, he, God uh, spoke to Nathan and said, Nathan, I didn't tell you to tell David that he could build that house. He says, David needs to understand some things first. He needs to understand that I don't dwell in a house of brick and, uh, and wood. And uh, although uh, that Ark of the Covenant uh, may have some reference to me, it's not me, and it's not possible that a house can hold God. And uh, if I wanted a house to live in, I wouldn't need to ask someone to build it for me. However, Nathan, David uh, uh, has the right motive, and his heart's right. But it would give the wrong impression to the people if I permitted him to, uh, to build this house for me. Because he's been a man of war, and he's not been uh, too careful of life, 
and uh, he's got some pretty dire sins uh, in his background. And uh, uh, what I what I will do, I will permit him to gather the material together, and his son can build uh, that which he has in mind. And of course, there there are prophetic implications for this too, uh, as uh, the uh, the son of God is building a house. Uh, we're called. The, the temple of the living God. So there were some some spiritual aspects to it. Uh, Solomon, the son of David, uh, is uh, is a picture in many ways of uh, that greater son of David who would come along later. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. So this uh, these first five verses are. Uh, uh, reminding the people of uh, this that David wanted to do. And then uh, the next five verses are by way of explanation. The people are saying, Lo, we heard of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the woods. Now this is talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which is the uh, habitation or the... Uh, the representative of God's presence. And you remember the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, this is recorded for you in uh, 1 Samuel chapters 4 and 5 and 6. And uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant had been brought back from the Philistines and it had been put in a wooded area. And then it had been kept at Shiloh, which was in... Ephraim. This uh, may be, uh, th this word Ephrata should be translated Ephraim. Both of those two words have, the, both of those two names have the same root. It means fruitfulness. And uh, of course, Ephrata is another name for Bethlehem. And there's a little different location. So probably this uh, is speaking of uh, the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was in Shiloh, which was located in Ephraim. Lo, we heard it of it at Ephrata. We found it in the fields of thine wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Now, this is the people uh, speaking of the Ark of the Covenant as God's footstool. You'll see where they got this from. And uh, the tabernacle where he is. Arise, O Lord, into thy strength, thou and the Ark of thy strength. Let the, pri let the priest be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy for thy servant. David sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Now we will go back and, uh, and review these verses and see what we can learn from them. First, uh, they're, uh, they're referring to the fact that... Uh, David decided to build this when uh, his la land had been afflicted because of his sin in numbering the people. And it says, Lord, remember David and all of his affliction. How he swore unto the Lord. This swearing doesn't mean using profanity. It means uh, he, uh, he promised the Lord or swore upon an oath. Bowed unto the mighty God of, of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go down, go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids. He says, I am so obsessed with wanting to do this that I can't be at rest in my own house. I can't enjoy this beautiful house I've built uh, for myself because all I can think about is how I want to build this great dwelling place for the for the Ark of the Covenant. So let's uh, let's see where the, this language comes from. First, let's turn to First Chronicles chapter 22, and we'll get the historical background of it.
see in uh, First Chronicles chapter 22, verse 14. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold. And uh, thousand thousands, or that would be a million, a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and of iron without weight for it is in abundance timber also and stone have i prepared that thou mayest add this now when he says in my troubles or in my afflictions this all arose out of a situation where uh, he had uh, he had numbered the people now David had, had the wrong motive in wanting to number the people. He wanted to see how great his strength was. He wanted to see uh, how strong a nation he had. And uh, God had to teach him that his strength was not in his armies. His strength was in his faith in God. And so uh, God had to bring a, a plague on the people because David was uh, feeling too proud of his position and so forth. And this uh, brought David much sorrow, and he uh, uh, he uh, afflicted himself, or that is, he fasted and he uh, uh, was in great remorse because he had brought this upon his people. And this is what he's talking about when he says, "In my trouble, in my affliction, I prepared." It was during this time that his soul was afflicted that he decided. Uh, that he wanted to to build a house. Now let's turn to back to first or the second Samuel chapter seven. And it, uh, second Samuel chapter seven. It came to pass. When the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Thus saith the Lord God, Shall thou build me a house to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And this is uh, that which I was, I was speaking with before. I was speaking about before. But he goes on to say in verse 10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. And then he goes on to say in, uh, in verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. This is God's, God's covenant to David. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And this is the historical background uh, of this particular psalm. Or this is what the song is all about. You see, uh, the, the worshipers are coming up to the temple area after the temple's already been built, and uh, they're reflecting upon how that temple happened to be there. And they're, uh, uh, they're bringing to mind this that they've learned from the historical scriptures as to, as to what transpired, which brought about this temple. And it was because David, in his affliction, uh, had purposed in his heart to do this. And he said, uh, uh, God, I'll not rest. I'll not, uh, I'll not be able to sleep until uh, you give me the, the permission to do this. I'll not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God. Now, and then they're saying, 
they, or that is their uh, ancestors, uh, found the Ark of the Covenant in the wooded place, and they brought it up to uh, uh, the place where where uh, it was put into the temple. Now, in verses seven and eight, we have a quotation that we'll find in. Uh, In 1 Chronicles 28, in 1 Chronicles 28, David has assembled here all of the things with which he's going to build the uh, the temple, and he uh, he appoints the uh, order of worship and such as that. See, uh, in uh, Psalm 132, verse 7, we will go into his tabernacles and we will worship at his footstool. Now look at 1 Chronicles 28, 2. And David the king stood upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a, a, a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and made ready for the building. And God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and shed blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before um, all the house of my fathers to be king over Israel forever, for he hath chosen Judah, and so forth. So he says, uh, God has chosen me and my progeny, to be kings forever, and then he went on in that same passage to say that uh, uh, his son would build the temple. So this is where we get the language, we shall go into his tabernacles and we will worship at his footstool. It's back in that historical account in First Chronicles that David called the Ark of the Covenant the footstool of God, because you see... Uh, God had already told him that, that he didn't dwell on this earth. And some, some of the other places in the Bible, the earth is called God's footstool. Uh, heaven's his throne and the earth is his footstool. And so this was the, the specific location of his footstool, the Ark of the Covenant. Now perhaps we ought to say a little bit about the Ark of the Covenant so that we'll understand uh, what it represents. It was a chest made of wood and it was covered with gold and had a golden, it had a, a golden top on it. Now, um, it, it was carried with two staves of wood that were covered with gold and these staves, these long poles, were to be kept in it all times. See, it had rings on on, each, on the side of the chest, and the staves went through those rings, and it was borne by uh, four of the Israelites. It was not to be uh, borne other than, than by a human being. Uh, the, a plague came on the country one time, if you remember, when they tried to haul it on a cart, because God said it shouldn't be done that way. And uh, inside of this chest, there were three items you'll remember. Uh, there was a pot, uh, a, a golden pot of manna, and uh, there were the two tables of stone that had been written by the finger of God, and uh, then there was Aaron's rod that butted. Now, all of these things speak of Christ. The, uh, the chest itself speaks of Christ. The wood speaks of his humanity, and uh, the gold speaks of his deity, because when gold is used in the Bible, figuratively, it's deity in manifestation. All the time he was in his human flesh, he was manifesting the deity of God. He was showing forth God and what God's like, and he showed it forth God in his miracles, in, what he, in his works and in his words. And so the, the chest itself represents Christ. 
uh, in, in his humanity and his deity. Then the pot of uh, manna represents Christ who sustains us in our wilderness journey. That's what the manna was for. It was, it was called angel's food. It was called the heavenly food from God that, that, that sustained them while they were walking in the wilderness. That's a picture of the fact that God sustains us spiritually when, when it, we're in this, uh, and when this wilderness walk, so to speak. And then the tables of stone speak of Christ, the word of God. Uh, God spoke through the Ten Commandments, but he also spoke through Christ when he was here. Then Aaron's rod that budded speaks of life out of death. See, uh, what happened, there was this little almond tree that grew up out of the dry ground. And it was cut off from the ground. And after it was cut off from the ground, then it came to life again. It budded. Well, that's a picture of the, uh, the fact that Christ grew up out of this earth as a human being. But before he came, it became a matured tree, you might say, he was cut off. But life came from that that was cut off. And so that speaks of his resurrection. All of this speaks of Christ. And then there was the mercy seat uh, where the blood was sprinkled uh, on top of that, and then the cherubim. All of these, all of this was part of what was called the Ark of the Covenant. And it represented the very presence of God, and it looked prophetically towards the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the significance of it. And you remember that this, uh, is, this item is what led the children of Israel all through their wilderness journey. Uh, when the, uh, the presence of God as represented by the pillar of cloud would rise up off of where the Ark of the Covenant was, that meant they were to march. And when it rested again, that means they were to, to, to rest, to stay there. And then you remember when they crossed, uh, when they came up to the River Jordan in order to cross into the Promised Land, that the River Jordan was in flood stage. And the uh, uh, Army Corps of Engineers was on strike and didn't have a way to put a bridge across. So uh, they, uh, uh, they didn't know how to get across, but God says, you let the priests take this uh, ark, and as soon as they step their feet in the water, we'll see what happens. And when, as soon as they place their feet in the water, the river rolled back like that, upon a heap, it says. And they walked across on dry ground, some three million or so of them. And uh, all their cattle and possessions and everything. So the, the Ark of the Covenant led them, and that's a picture of Christ leads us. Whatever the obstacle, uh, he, he goes before us. He said when he was here, before, he said, I am the good shepherd. Before I put my sheep forth, I go before them. And so uh, this is what, this is the significance of that Ark of the Covenant. Well, what David wanted to do was to build a, this temple for it because it was just in a tent. And he wanted to build a temple. And, of course, it was the central item in this ornate temple, which probably was the most ornate building that's ever been built. You can read the descriptive material uh, there in that uh, uh, 27th, 8th, 9th chapters of the uh, First Chronicles. So uh, this was the significance of this, uh, verse 7, we will go into his tabernacles and we will worship at his footstool. <clears throat> now he's going to quote from Second Chronicles, uh, from uh, uh, Solomon's dedicatory prayer. See this uh, verse 8, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength, let the priest be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. 
Now let's hold our place here and look in Second Chronicles chapter 6. The setting here would be a little later historically. This is uh, after uh, the uh, temple has been built, after David's dead now, and uh, under the auspices of his son Solomon, the temple has been built. And uh, Solomon prays a prayer of dedication. You'll find this prayer twice in the Bible. You'll find it in the 8th chapter of 1 Kings, and we're going to be looking at it in the 6th chapter of Second Chronicles. It's found in both of those places, and it's referred to in a number of the Psalms. So you get all of the dedicatory prayer in these two portions, and then you get parts of it in the Psalms, just like you're going to get part of it here. Look for a moment in Second Chronicles chapter 6, verse 41. Now therefore arise, O Lord God, into thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and thy saints rejoice in goodness. Now if you look back again at verses uh, 8 and 9, you have the same language, just it's what's known as a free translation. That is, uh, it may not have precisely the same words, but it's the, it's the same thought. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. So it's clear to see there that you have the same, uh, the same uh, content. It's taken, the, this portion of the psalm then, is taken right from Solomon's dedicatory prayer. Now here we have these pilgrims that probably lived a couple of 300 years later. And they're singing a song. Uh, they have come uh, to worship at Jerusalem, and now they're on the very site of the place where the, uh, uh, where the temple is. And uh, they're singing this psalm here. And as part of the words of the psalm, they're using Solomon's dedicatory prayer. It's a, long, it's a rather long prayer as Bible prayers go. You know, most Bible prayers are rather short. But uh, this is a, is a long prayer as, uh, in comparison. And the, what they're singing, they're quoting scriptures in their songs, aren't they? So that's a good, uh, that's a good precedent for us. As our songs need to have scriptural content. And that's what this song has. It has scriptural content. Then uh, you notice verse 10 of our psalm comes from 1 Chronicles 6.42. O Lord God, turn not away the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David thy servant. In the other place, for thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. You can see that it's uh, the same general content. So you have these... Uh, Verse 7, then, is a reference from 1 Chronicles 28.2, where David was praying unto God. Verses 8, 9, and 10 are from Solomon's prayer from God. And the psalmist took and put, these, put some of the contents of these two prayers <coughs> together when he, uh, when he made the psalm. So verse 10 concludes the portion which is the prayer. And then in verses 11 through 18, God is going to answer the prayer. Now you can get the, the picture of the fact that it's a prayer and an answer. If, uh, for instance, you look at verse 9 and verse 16. See, verse 9 says, they're speaking to God, says, let thy priest, God, let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. Then in verse 16, I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout for joy. So you see, that's a direct, God's direct response to the petition, isn't it? And the, the whole portion is like that, but the, those two verses give it to you very dramatically and show you that, uh, that part of the psalm is a petition. Part of the psalm is God's answer 
to the petition. So let's read his whole answer, and then we'll go back and look at the verses individually, beginning with verse 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children shall keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor, poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I, will, I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Now in, in verse 10 again, for thy, uh, no, verse 11 again, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David. Now this is a reference to that which we call the Davidic covenant. And uh, we find that in uh, Second Chronicles, in Second Samuel, chapter 7, where we were, and then we found the, find the exposition of the Davidic covenant is in Psalm 89, or that is the commentary on it. We might look there for just a moment. In, uh, you may recall this from when we were there. See, in Psalm 89, this is a song about the Davidic covenant. See, in verse 3, Psalm 89, verse 3, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Here's what he, uh, this is the covenant. This is what he swore. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up, uh, build up thy throne to all generations. And then you'll notice in uh, well the whole rest of the uh, this the psalm. Look in uh, verse thirty-four. My covenant will I not break, nor will I alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that will. Uh, that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever, like the moon, and as a faithful witness in the heavens. This, of course, speaks to the fact that uh, the this same uh, kingdom is going to be continued through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the seed of David. Uh, you remember the angel had reference to that at the Annunciation to Mary. If you want to look for a moment in uh, Luke chapter 2, this is about also a song about the Davidic covenant, but it's... Um, It's in, Psalm, it's in Luke chapter 1, I'm sorry. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused, and so forth. And this is what he, uh, verse 30, and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Now here it is. He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now this is the New Testament uh, exposition of this Davidic covenant to, to let us know that it's continued on in Christ. And uh, to this all of the prophets agree. For instance, 
it says that in uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, it says it in Jeremiah chapter 33, and a number of places in, in uh, Ezekiel, perhaps we'll have time to look at some of those. So back in verse 11 of our psalm, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it of the fruit of thy body will I set upon my throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever. Now, that, that promise to David was in two parts. One of it was conditional and one was unconditional. Now, here's the conditional part. God said, David, as long as your descendants will regard me and lead the people into serving me, just as long as that, one of your descendants will sit upon the throne. And uh, there will be a kingdom, and your descendants will be the king. But he says, if they turn away from me, he says, uh, I'll cut them off from being a kingdom, and your descendants will not sit on the throne. That is an if. If they'll follow me, then there'll be a king on the throne. If they will not follow me, there won't be a king on the throne. But the other part of the covenant was unconditional, and that was the part which said that it will be an everlasting throne, and the kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and that unconditional. Now, we saw the, the conditional part end because they didn't keep their condition. And so the time came when, when David no longer had a descendant sitting upon the throne in Jerusalem, did he? The kingdom ceased, and it's been ceased now for quite some time, but it's not going to be ceased forever. And, uh, for instance, this is what we, uh, we find in, in the book of Hosea, if you want to look there a moment. It comes right after Daniel. In, uh, in chapter 3, verse 4. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness. In the latter days, you have here uh, the fulfillment of the conditional part and the promise of the unconditional, the reiteration of the promise of the unconditional part. And that's what was given to Mary by the angel Gabriel. It was the reiteration of the unconditional part. Now, in, uh, in Hosea chapter 6, it says in verse 1, Come and let us, re this, is what, this is what's going to bring the throne back. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up. Well, this is prophetic language. It means uh, that uh, in the third thousand years that the throne is going to be uh, continued again. Now, there was uh, the spiritual leader in Jerusalem several years after Christ rose from the dead was named James. And James stood up, as recorded in the 15th chapter of Acts, and he said that God is going to call out a people for his name from among all the nations of the world, and after that, he'll build again the tabernacles of David, which are broken down. That's in Acts chapter 15, beginning with about the 14th verse and proceeding for a few verses. So you see, there's a conditional part of this covenant, and there's an unconditional part. 
Now we've li lived to see the nation of Israel fail to keep the conditional part and that that kingdom ceased. But whether or not the other part will be performed is not a matter of whether or not they performed because it's unconditional and it's going to happen. Verse 11, again, the Lord has sworn in truth unto David he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon the throne. Now that's the Lord Jesus Christ. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that, uh, that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon the throne forever. See, the fruit, the fruit of his body shall sit upon David's throne forever. That's unconditional. And Christ is that fruit of David's body that will sit upon the throne forever. That's why the book of Matthew starts out by saying that Christ is the son of David. And it gives the genealogy there to establish Christ as the son of David. That's the first verse of the, of the first chapter of the New Testament. So your... Uh, Verse 11 is your unconditional. Verse 12 is your conditional. If. See, it starts with an if. That's a conditional word, isn't it? The, the, the first part, the Lord hath sworn, no if, ands, and buts, of the fruit of thy body I will set upon thy throne. Then verse 12, if thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I will teach them, their children shall sit upon the throne. Well, they didn't, and their children are not sitting on the throne. Verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. Now, we need to look back in the book of Deuteronomy and in the uh, uh, 12th chapter. I suppose you're familiar with the fact that the book of Deuteronomy is a series of sermons all preached by Moses. And he preached them to the second generation of Israelites. You remember that uh, the first general, uh, generation of Israelites that came out of Egypt died in the desert because they would not trust God to take them into the promised land. And so Moses speaks to the second generation just before they're to go into the promised land. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. He's speaking to them. And part of what he says to them is in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and it has to do with where God is going to establish his place of worship. In uh, In chapter 12 of Deuteronomy, verse 5, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name, even unto his habitation shall he seek, and there they shall come. And that this is what he's talking about, that they're going to be coming up there. That's why they're going there, because God said they would. Look at verse 8 in Deuteronomy 12. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, for ye are not yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell in. Dwell there. There, there shall you bring all uh, that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and your heave offerings and so forth. He says in verse 13, Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord God shall choose. In verse 18, but thou shalt eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. In uh, uh, verse 21, if the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen 
Uh, verse 26, Only thy holy things which thou hast, thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. Now, six times over, in this one short passage, and again in the 14th chapter, seven straight times, see in, uh, in 14, chapter 14, verse 23, And thou shalt eat them before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name. Seven times he says, In that place that God shall choose. Now the place that he chose was a threshing floor on Mount Moriah. And that's where the temple was built. And that's why they came there. You remember the conversation in the fourth chapter of John between Jesus and the Samaritan woman? And uh, she says, uh, Our fathers say that we should worship at this, at this place in Samaria. But you Jews say you should worship at Jerusalem. Well, who was right? Uh, the, uh, well, she was right in, 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 in saying that their father said that, but the place where they were to worship, where God chose, was Jerusalem. And uh, that's what he means here, in the place that thou shalt choose. Now, when we apply this to ourselves, the rest of what Jesus said to that woman was that the time should come when neither, and now is, and the time shall come and now is, that neither in this mountain, that is in Samaria, nor in Jerusalem, shall you worship God. But God is spirit, and thou shalt, that those that worship him shall worship him in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh as such. So we don't go to a particular place now to worship God, but the principle is the same. He said, look, in, in this 12th chapter of Deuteronomy, he says, as long as you're just wandering around in the wilderness, you can do whatever you want to, because I can't use you there anyway. But if you ever essay to go over Jordan and get into the place where I'm going to teach you and instruct you, if you go over there, you must worship exactly like I say, or it's going to be a curse instead of a blessing. Well, the same thing is true today. If you're saved, but you're not involved in what God's doing, you're just wandering around out in the wilderness, not part of what God's doing, he really doesn't care that much about where you worship or what you do. But if you ever go across Jordan, that is, you say, I'm going to go in the place of God's service and be taught to do his work, then you better be sure that you're worshiping and in spirit and in truth and not any way that you want to. See, look in... in uh, Chapter 12, again, of Deuteronomy, verse 8. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. That is, while they were still in the wilderness. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. I suppose, you know, you see ads in the paper on Saturday, or say, go to the church of your choice. They'll have a whole, in, in the ledger in Lakeland, they'll have a whole page of ads by the merchants, and then on the bottom is that go to the church of your choice on Sunday. And uh, you hear the instruction, when you go, go to another city, uh, find a church that uh, will be uh, pleasing to you, and where you're happy and satisfied and worship there. Well, that's, that's doing just what God says don't do. He says, Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Don't do that. Because God has a place and a plan and a, a way. If you're going to call it worship, well, then find out what he has in mind. For ye are not as yet come. He says, as long as you're in the wilderness, it doesn't make that much difference. But when you go over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, then there shall be a place God will have some instructions along those lines. And the application is also to us that God has chosen. And uh, for the children of Israel, 
It was a particular place that he chose, and that, that place that he chose was this place to which these worshipers were going up when they were singing these songs of ascent. Now let's look in Second Chronicles chapter 7 again, and you'll see in Solomon's prayer there, In Solomon's prayer, this is in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. That's the place. When he was... Uh, when Moses said back in Deuteronomy, God is going to choose a particular place. And uh, uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Moses said, God's going to choose a second place, a certain place. And in uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, this is the place. That ought to... That ought to uh, Resolve the situation. This is the place that God has chosen. See, back in Second Chronicles 6, verse 20. This is Solomon's prayer. That thine eyes may be upon, open upon this house day and night, upon the place of which thou hast said, that thou wouldst put thy name there to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayer prayeth towards this, this prayer. And Solomon knew that this was the place that God had chosen. So back in our Psalm 132, verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. That's the place he chose. Verse 14, This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. In other words, as long as you're uh, coming here, I will clothe all. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Now, there's a principle that's as good today as it was then. When God's spokesmen are. Uh, uh, when God's spiritual leaders are clothed with righteousness, then the people will rejoice. Now, there's two aspects of being clothed with righteousness. The very moment we're saved, God wraps the perfect righteousness of Christ around us. That's the first aspect. That's for our standing before God. The very moment we, that's the very, very moment, the very moment we're saved, we stand before God clothed in righteousness. The other aspect is for our walk. As we appropriate the righteousness of Christ, then we're showing forth his righteousness in our walk. And so that's the appropriated righteousness and that's for our walk. And that is less than perfect because we don't appropriate perfectly. But the, the righteousness in which we stand is perfect. The righteousness in which we walk is perfect to the extent that we appropriate the righteousness pro provided. Well, first, God's spokesman must be clothed with that perfect righteousness standing before God. And then they need to walk in righteousness. And when his spiritual leaders are walking in righteousness, then his people shout for joy. Verse 17, There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for my anointed. Now, we've pointed out the meaning of this word horn. We've had it in a number of Psalms. We'll have it again in Psalm 148, and we'll kind of do a review on it then, but it simply means that David 
would get his strength back. This word bud is the same word, uh, it's the, uh, it's the verb of the noun. You know, in, in several places, Christ is called the branch of Jehovah. Uh, twice in Isaiah, twice in Jeremiah, and twice in Zechariah. We'll just look at one place, Jeremiah 23. In Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Now you'll notice the word branch is capitalized. It's because it's a name for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, uh, Jeremiah wrote uh, some 400 years after David. David was dead and in the grave. But he says, I'm going to raise up unto David a righteous branch that is he's going to bud forth again and the king shall reign and prosper this is speaking of Christ he might uh, in verse 6 and in his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell in safety this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness so then the priests and God's people shall reign shall be clothed in perfect righteousness and uh, might look at just one more since we're in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33. Verse 15. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely and this is the name by which she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now we could find that word branch capitalized, as I say, twice in Isaiah and twice in Zechariah, as well as these two times in Jeremiah. And it's a name of Christ. He's going to bud forth. And this word in our Psalm 17, there will I make the horn of David to bud. That's the verb form of the same word to branch out. And the horn of David is a name of Christ. He will be a horn of David. And another name of Christ is the horn of our salvation. That's the name that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, calls him in Luke chapter 1, the horn of our salvation. There will I make the horn of David the bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. David is the anointed, and Christ is the lamp for his anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. See, it speaks of the people of God being clothed with righteousness and the enemies of God being clothed with shame. Whatever we are, God says we're clothed with that. You know, Monday night we're teaching in the book of, of Hosea and uh, down in Sebring. And uh, we saw a very interesting verse in Hosea chapter 9 that uh, is on this, on this same line. Let's see. No, it's in Hosea chapter 10, verse 6. In Hosea 10, 6, it shall be also carried unto Assyria for a present to the king Jared. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Now, you know, in the book of Hosea, Ephraim and Israel are the same. Only they're called Ephraim when it's speaking of going away from God, and it's, they're called Israel when it's when it's speaking about their God's people. in the parallel would be a saved person who is not living for the Lord. He's not walking with God, but he's truly saved. Uh, well, his, uh, his spiritual aspect is Israel and his fleshly aspect is Ephraim. 
when you relate it to the book of Hosea. So it says here, uh, it says, Ephraim shall receive shame and Israel shall be ashamed. Now there's a difference between receiving shame and being ashamed. The Lord Jesus Christ says that some of us saved people we will be ashamed at his coming. That's in 1 John chapter 2. We will be ashamed at his appearing. And it says we're his children. But we'll be ashamed. But it says those that are the enemies of God will receive shame and confusion. So uh, an unsaved person that uh, obviously is not walking with God shall receive shame. A saved person who is not walking with God shall be ashamed. And uh, so the he won't be clothed with shame. Those that are enemies of God are unsaved. They'll be clothed with shame. But some of us that are clothed with the righteousness of Christ are going to be ashamed because our walk didn't conform with our position. So, uh, in other words, uh, we, the, the unsaved receive shame if they're not doing right, which they aren't, and the saved will be ashamed if they're not walking right. You see the difference? Uh, this word shame. Uh, see, in, uh, in Romans chapter 10, whosoever believeth shall not be ashamed. Ashamed means to receive the eternal shame of your situation. To bow your head and say, boy, did I ever miss it. Be ashamed. Well, it's better, it's better not to be ashamed or receive shame. But, uh, it's ten times worse to receive shame. So that's what the psalmist is saying. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. That is, the one that will be David's budding horn. Now, this, I realize this psalm is a little difficult to put together. It takes, it needs a lot of your own meditation, because you see, it's it's a conversation, it's a petition to God, and in the petition, God's words are being used, and they, in that ten verses of petition, the words come from so many passages, and those each of those passages has a context uh, that gives it its depth, but. I suppose if we really wanted to study this psalm, what we'd need to do is to spend about four or five lessons on it so that we could consider each context, wouldn't it? Because the petition part is a compilation of, uh, of prayers and promises. If it comes from chapters in 2 Samuel, as we've seen. It comes from chapters in, in Kings. It comes from chapters in 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and then another number of Psalms, and you have references. We didn't even point out the fact that in, when Stephen preached his sermon in the 7th chapter of Acts, he refers to this Psalm. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 7, Verse 46, he refers to the fifth verse. So, we could, we could spend all of this time on it. Well, obviously we can't do that in uh, an hour, or I've taken an hour and ten minutes already. Uh, so, what we need to do is, when we see a psalm like this that has so much scripture in it, uh, we just need to use it for our own quiet time.
and uh, and find out what God has. I I have all kind of marginal notes that I never did get into on this uh, this particular psalm. So I feel a little frustrated that I didn't really do justice by it. But you'll just have to do that between you and the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this marvelous book that you've given to us in all of its intricacy. We pray, God, that uh, we'd have a heart and a desire to spend the time before you. It's necessary to have all of these truths unfolded to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.